All right, let's get started. So uh, my name is Lior Shimron. I'm the Vice President of Digital Asset Strategy at Fundstrat Global Advisors. And I'm also a Forbes contributor where I write about crypto and blockchain. Fundstrat is an independent research firm providing equities and crypto research to over 200 institutional investors and 700 retail investors. We also have a consulting practice where we advise companies in all segments of the crypto industry. Now I'm extremely excited for our topic of discussion today, which will cover DeFi investing and adoption. We have a lot to get through, so let's jump right in. So just to get started, I'd love for all of our panelists to briefly introduce themselves. Uh, maybe starting with Min, then Larry, then Michael, then Santiago. Please take 30 seconds, introduce yourself. Hi everyone, I'm Min Teo, based in London, and I lead the investment team at Consensus. We've been investing in the space for several years now and have a portfolio of more than 100 early stage companies ranging from infrastructure to decentralized applications. DeFi is a core focus for us and it's great to see our ecosystem reach an inflection point in terms of UX and resilience and it can't come at a better time. Uh, thanks for having me, really look forward to the discussion. Great, Larry, would you like to go next? Yep. Hey guys, Larry Sikarnik with DCG where I lead venture investments. Um, and if you're not familiar with DCG, we're um, a conglomerate, I think the only large conglomerate in the space. And um, you know, there's three parts to our business. There's the, um, the subsidiaries, which are businesses we own and operate, um, companies like Coindesk and Grayscale. There's our digital currency portfolio. And finally, there's the venture portfolio, which is at this point over 160 companies. Great, Michael? Hey, um, my name is Michael Anderson, one of the co-founders of Framework Ventures. Uh, Framework is a venture investment firm uh, specifically focused on DeFi. Uh, we have about 20 investments in, um, in DeFi, including Chainlink, Synthetix, Aave, uh, and a number of others. <clears throat> um, we also incubate a number of companies. Um, we have a different, slightly different model than most other funds uh, where we're building alongside a lot of the investments that we make uh, and users of a lot of the platforms that we build with. Great, Santiago. Yeah, hey everyone, uh, Santiago, I'm a partner of Parify Capital. Uh, similar to framework, we're exclusively focused on investing in DeFi, um, typically run a fairly concentrated portfolio. Um, I guess different from, from perhaps most other funds, we are large uh, users of DeFi networks and that largely informs our, our thesis uh, and we are, uh, big liquidity providers. So we have a specific separate fund to our token fund uh, that is providing liquidity across networks like that we're investing in like Compound, Maker, uh, Synthetix, uh, Uniswap. And so uh, that really, um, when we invest in projects, we work very closely with them and provide liquidity, which ends up being the lifeblood of these networks. Great. Santiago, I'd like to start with you. Um, in order to help build a loyal community, projects like Uniswap and Wire and have been rewarding users with tokens. What is the concept of a DeFi fair launch? How does it differ from ICOs, pre-mines, and even Bitcoin's launch? Yeah, it's a great, uh, great question and a, uh, very topical. Um, you know, I think uh, you, you look at a network like Wi-Fi that um, distributed tokens to liquidity providers in the system, and uh, even the founder Andre uh, did not take a, a, pre a share himself. Uh, and I think that really builds a very strong community when, when the power users of these networks are earning uh, and having a fair shot at earning tokens. Um, and so everyone's on an equal basis, right? Uh, and I think that really sets the stage for creating, uh, I mean, really bootstrapping communities in a very interesting way. Uh, uh, you don't have unfair advantages. You don't have, uh, you know, certainly I'd say like large liquidity providers uh, earn uh, perhaps a, a greater share, but the proportion itself based on what you're providing to the system is, is kind of a constant. And so, yeah, we're seeing really interesting experiments like Wi-Fi, uh, YAM, and, and really across the board, some other projects really adopting this view of, of, of going to market in this way. Got it. Great. Um, I'm sure we're going to return this topic a little bit later in the conversation, but I'd like to shift over to Min um, and talk about NFTs or non-fungible tokens. So we're seeing non-fungible token activity really pick up within DeFi. Do you think NFTs would be, will be the first use case to bring DeFi to the mainstream? Um, one can hope. <laughs> you know, uh, NFTs have been a pretty good store of value. They haven't been very liquid, however, until recently, despite best efforts of a lot of early teams and marketplaces. 
I mean, we saw many crypto kitties hold value through the bear market, which is not really surprising given art pieces kind of work the same way. Um, liquidity is really something that the DeFi bull run has brought to the NFT space, which is fitting given, given NFTs themselves are financial assets, the same way investment art is, and they require the same infrastructure, community participants, pricing dy dynamics, and so on to have a healthy market. Um, with that said, I think we're actually seeing more of DeFi powering NFTs rather than the other way around at the moment. It's an incredible showcase of the composability and extensibility of DeFi primitives and the broad range of new activity it enables. But right, most NFT activity today is driven probably by speculation. Um, at the same time, though, I think, you know, NFTs are I think um, both you and Santiago touched on something interesting, which was liquidity within DeFi. Um, you know, Larry, going off of that tangent, I'd like to ask you um, about yield farming, you know, which really has offered supercharged returns for investors that provide early, early liquidity to these protocols. Um, do you think liquidity mining is having the intended effect of attracting long-term users to the space, or will usage be short-lived once incentives run out? Hey guys, we just lost stream. We are going to re-rack here in just a moment. They didn't like the question. Michael, um, yield farming has offered supercharged returns for investors that provide early liquidity to these DeFi protocols. Is liquidity mining having the intended effect of attracting long-term users to the space or will usage be short-lived once incentives run out? Yeah, great question. Um, I think what we've seen is that liquidity mining works in building short-term attention and getting short-term activation or engagement. But one of the things that I think we're starting to learn is that yield farming is not in just the way that it's designed currently, something that attracts long-term ownership and participation. Um, I think one of the examples we saw recently is that all of all the compound tokens that have been mined so far, so 87% far, of them have been sold, uh, which suggests that the governance rights that compound and comp token are affording these users is not something that attracts them enough to be able to keep the comp and keep the governance rights. Um, as a counterpoint to that, I think one of the examples of something where it's working is something like synthetics, where you have a, a one-year lockup and a continued use of those tokens while they're being locked up. At the same time, synthetics tokens, once they have come unlocked starting in May of this year, 
uh, only about 20% of them have been sold um, after they've become unlocked, uh, which suggests that if you have that long-term buy-in, maybe through a forced or even an opt-in mechanism of locking tokens, it could be something that's more beneficial for long-term engagement. Interesting. And that's really specific to the token design of each individual pro uh, protocol, right? It, exactly. And, and this is where mechanism design, token design really plays a huge part in designing the engagement model for these users and, and how you can infect, uh, affect the different long-term or short-term engagement models. Uh, but this is where you got to be really smart about how you design the token. Awesome. Uh, Larry, switching over to you, um, DeFi protocols are open source and can be forked at any time. And we've already seen attacks evidenced by Sushi Swap trying to steal liquidity from Uniswap in the so-called vampire attack. How do DeFi protocols build a moat? What defensible characteristics should investors look out for? And ever since Warren Buffett came up with that term moat, it feels like the investment community has, you know, just ran off with it. <clears throat> You know, it's, it's a good term, um, and, and I think it, it's a good way to think qualitatively as an investor about the things you're investing in, right? And, um, and I think people, especially when they approach a new space, whether maybe it's internet in the late 90s um, or crypto today, um, they tend to over-intellectualize what moats are, right, for businesses, for networks, for protocols. Um, I, I think at the end of the day, the very same moats that apply to businesses will apply to decentralized networks, right? You, you look at things like brand. Um, a good brand is a very strong mode for a business. A good brand is a very strong mode for a network. You look at things like Uniswap um, and you know that there's a strong consumer goodwill with using that website. Um, people go there, people swap. You, you feel good when you're on uniswap.com, right? Or, or .org, I forget what it is now. Um, and I think a lot of the same moats really do apply to decentralized networks, and there's no need for us to over-intellectualize things. Great. Yeah, no, that makes a ton of sense. Um, brands still matter, you know, even though it's DeFi and these protocols are decentralized. Um, Santiago, going back to you, um, TVL or total value locked really is the most common metric that investors and users look at to determine growth of the overall space and ecosystem. How do you measure and quantify community growth and involvement? Are there any other metrics that you would suggest users and investors look at? Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, TBL is sort of like a vanity metric uh, for, for, for some of these networks because what you have to look at is the underlying sort of value accrual. Um, I mean, TBL and, and Kyber is very different than TBL and Uniswap, very different than TBL and Synthetics. Um, and so ultimately, I mean, I mean, I think it requires uh, you know, looking at the underlying protocols to see uh, truly how they monetize that TVL. Um, sometimes that is not even the relevant metric uh, to measure the earnings potential of a network. Um, and so, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, an exchange business is quite different from from something like, uh, you know, Wi-Fi, for instance, or Aave that is deposit or Compound, right? Very different business models. Uh, to your question around community and how we measure that, it's a little bit more, um, um, I'd say, harder to quantify. I mean, we can look at the, the level of engagement in, across, you know, Discord channels, GitHub commits, and it really is, there's not a perfect answer to that, but I think you, you sort of get the feeling when, when you are start interacting with these networks, if the community is, to Michael's point earlier, if, if they're there to stay or they're just there to farm and dump uh, and truly be sort of like, um, you know, liquidity is a transient mode in some of these networks. And so what you have to look at is, you know, what are the core developers? How are they incentivized? And, and, and what are they building? And, and I think really uh, at the end of the day, bear markets are great, great. Um, it really tests the conviction of the community. And I can't think of, uh, you know, better protocols like, you know, Avi and Synthetics really been forged in the fire of, of bear markets. And I think that's, it, to me, that's the strongest indicator um, of, of community. And, uh, you know, I think it's not only, I mean, we saw yesterday MetaMask has one monthly, um, one million monthly active users, which is a remarkable metric, I think. Um, but, it, you know, I, I think um, uh, one of the perhaps more interesting metrics is, uh, would you rather have a million users, uh, a million farmers, or would you rather have a thousand diehard community members? And I think synthetics comes top of mind uh, it has a very strong community that uh, now that the network is fully decentralized and you've really de-risked the core team like Kane and, and Jordan and the core members have sort of taken a, a, a less 
they're still relevant. They're still important. There's, there's, there's still a team behind synthetics, but a lot of community members have um, become and stepped up. And I think a maker as well, uh, where these networks, I think over time, de-risk de the sort of the key man risk and truly become decentralized organizations that um, have continuity. And so long-winded answer, but I think it, you really have to look at independent networks and, and start become, uh, the best way to measure that is just become very active in these, uh, in governance and in, in the Discord channels and, and get a better sense of, of, of how the community is evolving. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think that kind of brings us back to the first question about fair launches and how there's all these new experiments that are going on in terms of just getting the token into people's hands and like what's the best way to do that and incentivize different stakeholders within these networks. So I think that's largely something that's still developing. It'll be interesting to see how that continues to develop. So um, moving on, uh, Michael, um, you know, we've been seeing Bitcoin really invading DeFi over the last few months. Uh, tokenized Bitcoin now totals over, I think it's $1.3 billion or about 0.66% of Bitcoin's total supply. What role will Bitcoin play in DeFi? Do you think the growth of Bitcoin on the Ethereum blockchain fundamentally threatens or bolsters either ones of either one of those chains? To unpack that, I think you know, the, essentially there's two arguments. There's two discussion points here. The first is what does Bitcoin in DeFi mean, and and the second is is it a threat or is it a benefit? Um, <clears throat> and I think the the first one here is uh, we just have yet to see really new swaths of liquidity coming into uh, DeFi and Ethereum writ large. Other than stable coins, at least our view is that Bitcoin could represent that next uh, layer of liquidity that DeFi is looking for and, and wanting to attract to the ecosystem. Um, and I think if we think about just what the, the activation energy is for people who are staying on the sidelines in traditional finance versus people who have Bitcoin, uh, it's a very lo a very easy logical leap to go from I have Bitcoin to I want to use it in productive ways um, versus people who have dollars or financial assets in traditional finance and they want to use that in DeFi. And so I think the next logical leap for DeFi is to start to usurp some of the centralized crypto finance that we've seen. We saw September, uh, I think it was on block research, about 14% of DEX volume was actually DeFi. Uh, of all volume was DeFi, was DEXs. And so I think that as we start to see DeFi eat CeFi, this logical leap of Bitcoin coming into DeFi will be the next kind of, maybe the next $10 billion of total value locked in DeFi. And then I think, you know, what are the steps to get there? And does this threaten the Ethereum ecosystem? I think we have yet to see a clear cut winner in a truly trustless bridge for Bitcoin into Ethereum. And I think that's what's really been holding things up. Uh, Ren seems to be making some interesting moves. You know, TBTC hopefully can, can provide another uh, competitive uh, product there. But I think, you know, we, still, we also need to see the infrastructure ready to go to be able to support all these different variants of Bitcoin on ETH, whether it's maybe a curve competitor to uh, having a stable coin or Bitcoin uh, AMM type model is something that we need if we have all these different variants and if we're trading them and using them productively. Um, but I think those are the things that we're looking for is just what's that trustless bridge. And then we're really excited about DeFi having Bitcoin involved. Awesome. Um, and turning over to you. Um, so Ether's performance hasn't exactly been in line with DeFi tokens. As DeFi grows, do you believe Ether will inevitably accrue value as well? Or will DeFi applications accrue most of the value? Yeah, so I think, you know, in some sense, comparing ETH with, you know, DeFi, it's a bit of a good like case of comparing apples with oranges. You know, ETH is a reserve asset. DeFi tokens are far more speculative. They each have their own market betas, correlations with traffic market indicators. Um, ultimately, DeFi increases activity on Ethereum, which also increases network transaction fees, which, which has shown over time to be positive correlated with value of it, the Ethereum network. Um, you know, in early September, there was a data Ethereum posted 500K in fees in just one hour. Um, I think DeFi token prices outpacing ETH at the moment doesn't mean that markets are efficient 100% of the time. And you can make a good argument about why ETH is undervalued. You could see value reversion in the long run. Um, you know, no investment advice from my case, just, you know, from a purely <laughs> theoretical view. Um, I think, you know, in terms of activity, uh, particularly with the rollout of EIP-1559 um, and, uh, you know, a lot of L2 innovations such as rollups, you'll see faster transactions on Ethereum that are more gas efficient. 
And you know, they'll increase the usage of ETH as collateral activity in general. So the idea that DeFi on Ethereum will be successful, but ETH won't accrue any value doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. Um, in general, I think settlement functions and the money nature of the base layer protocols is massive. The combined valuation of all the ETH alternatives show the enormity of the market potential. And I think both will grow, especially as more capital enters the space and innovation develops. The market potential can sustain significant growth for both DeFi and Ethereum in the years to come. Great. Uh, Larry, so um, DeFi today is largely confined to really an insular user base within the crypto community. Typically individuals who are more tech savvy and understand crypto very well. Do you envision DeFi having applications outside of crypto? And will DeFi encourage a larger group of financial professionals to enter the space? You know, I think at the end of the day, it's about what problem is DeFi solving? Just like any other product, right? What problem is it solving for the end customer? And um, is, uh, is the friction to getting to that product high or low, right? And I think today, obviously, DeFi is solving a lot of problems for people. Certainly, you know, the folks on the Zoom call, um, the yields are high and, um, and the alternatives are low. And so they solve, DeFi solves a big problem. Um, but the, I think, you know, the reason it's not really gone into mainstream consciousness, in other words, you know, you're not really seeing folks like your parents or your friends who don't work in the industry using DeFi is because the friction is so damn high, right? If you just send someone some ether, give them some free ether and say, hey, you know, buy some uh, token on Uniswap and, um, and you tell them to, to do that in, in a half hour or so, no one's going to be able to figure it out, right? Even though the problem is being solved, right? The friction is too high. And so I think, you know, as a community, um, we've not really done a great job of thinking about product and user experience and, and educating the market on how to actually use these products and why they're actually important. Um, and I think the only way for the uh, you know addressable market to grow is for the product to solve a problem um, and continue solving the problem. And two is for the friction to significantly go down because right now it's really hard to use. Right. And I think especially with the um, Ethereum fees being so exorbitant, you know, you're really pricing out so many users. So, you know, if you want teenagers sent to the space and just tinker around and play with these tools, they're not able to because, you know, you need at least a thousand dollars, if not more, in order for it to be, you know, economically viable given these huge fees. You know, um, what do you, what do you think is kind of going to come of all of that? And like, are these fees going to naturally compress with ETH 2.0 or maybe move to other chains? Um, just kind of an open question for anyone who wants to take it. Well, the fees suck, right? Um, even investors think that, right? Think about how much we're all spending on fees. You know, I, I think this is a solvable problem, right? There are so many smart people who are productive that are incentivized to make Ethereum scale. And over time, I, I think it's really hard to bet against smart people. And I think they'll figure out a cool solution, whether it's scaling the main chain or, um, you know, using some sort of layer twos. But Long story short, I think um, I think you know fees will go down over time. I think everyone thinks that as well. It's just a matter of when, not if. I think we're already there in some respects, right? You have Optimism launching two weeks ago. Anyone that, I mean, God, I mean, we saw this. The, 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 there was a pilot early on in, in, in March, was it, where Synthetics rolled out Optimism. I mean, you you saw that, and, and you saw a path towards. It's like you're migrating from dial-up to broadband, uh, fast settlement, and you're talking about cents, right? Um, not only that, but like some like USDC now enables like U.S. transactions, just pure signatures. So to Larry's point, like I mean, I think we're 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 converging in a state of the world where fees will will compress quite a lot and, and enable um, through layer two um, um, users, like regular users, uh, to not pay you know 18 bucks per transaction, more like two cents uh, or less than a cent. Uh, I think you know that's the nature of the state of the world in many ways, like. You know, Ethereum, DeFi, crypto is not ready for mainstream adoption. It's a good natural barrier to have when we are testing protocols that can blow up overnight. Like your MVP in DeFi is is still quite risky. And so in many ways, you know, we should take the scalability concerns always been overblown. In my opinion, I think these things take time to to test and battle test. And I, I'm glad that we haven't seen a billion users. Uh, let's onboard a billion developers build lots solid products and, and then and then naturally i think people will come and uh but you know we we're not far away from that state of the world and optimism 
XDI and a bunch of other solutions out there are 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 out there and are working. So yeah, I think that's very well said. So it looks like we're running up against the end of our time. Um, as the last question, I'd love for everyone to chime in. But um, what is in store for the future of DeFi? What exciting innovations are yet to be built? Maybe let's start with uh, Min. Sure. I mean, I think we want DeFi for the unbanked, but not as we think of it. Like, you know, I think DeFi protocols and applications targeted as startups, teenagers, the scene, how it's provided access to wealth creation. And there's huge, huge potential to provide a few more months of runway to startups or to provide kids with a way to learn how to manage their money. Great. Larry? If I had a good answer to this, I would start a company, not be an investor. So I'll pass it on to the other guys. Sure. <laughs> Michael? Um, yeah, I'd say, you know, solving all the different financial primitives is probably the next three to five years. But as we look past that, we're looking at things where speculation and entertainment actually combine. Uh, we've always talked about games on, on blockchain. I think, you know, if we really think about what DeFi is in some respects, it actually, it is a game. Uh, and I think the, the, mel the melding of those two worlds could combine at some point. Great. And Santiago? Yeah, I mean, candidly, candidly, like we've never had this for a paradigm of programmability of money with if-then statements combined with really powerful incentives. And I think like, you know, DeFi broadly, we define it as just transfer of value. And now you have the ability, like crypto single-handedly created digital scarcity. And so like, you know, this idea of fiat is relatively young. And so how we, I think it's going to uh, enable us to look back and, and is it crazy to like, you know, put your uh, collateral with uh, an NFT uh, to pay down your mortgage, not crazy. And so I think we're we're just scratching the surface, I think, of what we think of value uh, and really just uh, create new primitives. Uh, for now, it's a lot been like, hey, let's copy existing primitives and traditional finance into DeFi. But the composability of the space and also the open source nature of it, I think is attracting, to Larry's point, one of the smartest developers out there. And so very, very excited. Any new entrant into DeFi creates sort of highly synergistic increases the value of existing protocols. And so that level of open source innovation candidly opens up and detonates like a whole like catalyst for new innovation. And my imagination doesn't stretch that far. If it would, I wouldn't be an investor, I'd be a builder to Larry's point. So I'll leave it there. Great. Awesome. Thanks so much, everyone. This is really an awesome conversation. Appreciate, appreciate you all making the time to be on here and lending your insights. Thank you to the audience for taking the time to listen and I uh, hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thank you. Bye, guys.